Hello, welcome to Sydney, Australia. Today we're on board the destroyer HMAS Vampire. Join us today for an in-depth look at this fantastic ship. The Vampire is actually the second Vampire that was built to continue the name made famous by the V&W class destroyer. The first Vampire and her sister ships formed the famous Scrap Iron Flotilla, so named by the Germans in reference to their age and condition. The second Vampire was commissioned to the Royal Australian Navy on the 23rd of June 1959 and remained in service until 1986. Her crew nicknamed her the Bat after a flying Vampire Bat insignia perched on the aft funnel on the ship. Underneath the insignia is the Latin motto Odemius, which translates as Let us be daring, a great pun considering the ship being daring class. Here we are now on the bridge of the ship. Now it was from the bridge that the big three were conducted. That is the safety of the ship, the navigation, and also the steering. Now this actual ship, the until the refit in 1970, was open and exposed to the elements. Surrounding me, you can see various controls, taking pride of place in the center here is the ship's compass. Just to my right is the rudder indicator, and across there you can see the engine order equipment. Another thing which is really interesting up on the bridge is also the sonar equipment, of course used to actually identify submarines. The wheelhouse where the actual steering of the ship is carried out, with orders coming from the bridge above. As you can see, it's an incredibly well protected environment. We're here now at the nerve centre of the ship, the operations room. It was here during battle stations that the captain would control and command the ship. Some 22 personnel were present in this room, including weapons and systems officers and radar specialists, all with one clear aim in life, to collate and gather tactical information and react to any possible threat. The room is absolutely full of equipment, but some of the key things to point out. And just to the left of me is the radar for reacting to any aerial threat. Across to my right-hand side, we can see the submarine plotter, and directly above that, the mortar control was to react to any possible submarine threat. Directly across from me, we've also got the surface plotter. This area is where the radio operators would maintain communications with other ships around the world. Also, one of the other important tasks they had, certainly from a morale point of view, was to receive telegrams for the sailors. The Daring Class destroyer design evolved in Britain during the Second World War. Requirements for a new fleet destroyer for the Royal Navy saw the first of eight ships ordered in March 1945. The Daring's had a standard displacement of 2,800 tonnes, which increased to 3,600 tonnes at full load. The new ships were so far beyond accepted destroyer design that many naval authorities claimed they should be classified as light cruisers. The ship and her sisters were 120 metres long with a beam of 13 metres. Her propulsion system consisted of two Foster Wheeler boilers feeding two English electric gear turbines, which provided 54,000 horsepower to two propeller shafts. Vampire could sail at over 30 knots and had a range of 3,700 nautical miles at 20 knots. Her standard ship's company consisted of 20 officers and 300 sailors, quite a number for any destroyer. We're very lucky now to be joined by Len. Len, thanks ever so much for talking to us. Now, you served on HMAS Vampire. I um, did, I did. For how long? Some years. <laughs> and your role on the ship was? I was a gunnery man. Fantastic. So very apt then. So We're obviously in the gun bay. Place, yeah. um, can you tell us a little bit about the gun bay, please, Len? The gun bay? Well, it's very uh, 
important part of the whole system because this is a transfer point for the ordnance from the fixed structure of the ship to the moving structure of the turret. Because the turret above is all attached to this, so when this rotates, when the turret rotates, all this rotates with it. So you're getting the ordnance from the ship into the turret, all hand moved, until uh, you're ready to load the guns, and then you've got these hoists here. That's a hoist for the projectile to go up to the gun, and another one behind here for the propellant, which is cordite to go up to the gun. So it all has to be organised around these rings. So if you've got your back to the gun when you're taking the ordnance out of the hoist from the magazine, you turn back around, the gun's in a different position. So you have to put the ordnance the right way around. So the Navy's very good. They put a little cutout on top so you know which way to put the ordnance in. So you don't get it back to front. And we were discussing briefly earlier on about the fuses um, yeah. on the ammunition, um, various fuses you use. So for example, the one at the moment on the, on the platform there. The one on the, ready on the hoist, is what's called a time mechanical. It's got a clock fuse and you set it to so many seconds to detonate after it leaves the barrel. The other type is a direct action, which is this one, requires impact to detonate. And the third one, which we can't display because uh, the Navy wouldn't give us any, that's a proximity fuse. It detonates 20 feet in front of a target. Here we are in the turret, which is the end result of what you were looking at in the gun bay. Where the ordnance comes up to the turret, the propellant comes up in this hoist here, and the projectile comes up in this hoist. Two loaders are here that take the ordnance out of the hoist and put them on the loading tray, which is in front of us here. Cordite goes on first, then the shell. Once they're on, hands together and strike the rammer, which then, under hydraulic power, throws the ordnance up into the breech and, and shuts the breech. When the gun fires, the gun recoils spits the empty out and recocks the rammer. Now this is happens every three and a half, one every three and a half seconds, which is quite a bit. When you consider the projectile weighs 25 kilos and the cordite weighs about 17 kilos. Inside the turret is not actually noisy for the firing. It certainly, it makes a bit of noise, but the biggest amount of noise is the hydraulic motors that run everything. And uh, when the empty goes into the bin, which is in the centre of the gun bay, that makes a lot of noise as well. This is the captain's day cabin. And as you can see, it's full of home comforts, something which the majority of the crew didn't have. The ship's sick bay was incredibly well stocked, and of course it had to be to cover every eventuality. As well as those four and a half inch guns, Vampire also had other weaponry on board. Behind me, we can see the Beaufort's anti-aircraft gun, this particular one being the Mark V and 40 mm. It was an effective gun with a maximum range of 2,500 meters and a rate of fire of 140 rounds per minute. HMAS Vampire served in the Royal Australian Navy from 1959 to 1986. Despite her armament, Vampire had a peaceful career and was not involved in any combat. She was involved in the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization exercises held off Singapore during the Indonesian confrontation with Malaysia in 1965 and offered gun support whilst escorting troops to Vietnam in the 1960s. In June 1970, she sailed into Williamstown Dockyard in Victoria to undergo an extended refit as part of being paid off for her half-life modernization. She received new gun turrets and fire control systems, new aircraft warning and navigation radar, 
plus replacement of a major portion of a superstructure, including a closed bridge. Her old funnels were replaced with new ones. The Pentar torpedo mount was removed and a new radar suite was installed to stay relevant to changing times. HMAS Vampire was decommissioned on the 13th of August 1987. After serving 27 years in the Royal Australian Navy and clocking up in the region of 808,000 nautical miles. In 1997, she was gifted to the Australian National Maritime Museum to be preserved as a museum ship. <laughs>